We are recording today's workshop. Thank you. I'm glad we got it. Timer is set. All right, 10 more seconds on my timer. Please share what you have. And if you haven't yet, read through that chat sidebar and see if there's other ones that you relate to. I know you were all focused on writing, but as I was getting them in, I was like, oh yeah, nod, 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 uh-huh. Oh, that one. I was like, I can't help it, but gesturing like that. <laughs> A lot of these are so good. Yeah, this is great grounding for today's talk. So this is the kind of change we can make that we're talking about today. All right, I'm gonna start talking again. Uh, now I'm gonna talk about when to influence culture because it's not always worth it, honestly. Sometimes you wanna leave. I'm assuming in this whole talk, you have time and energy to work on influencing the culture where you work. And if you don't have time or energy, don't do anything I'm saying. You can't afford to, that's okay. Uh, but if you do have the time and energy, you can change culture. And on the flip side of that, you don't have to. I'm not telling you you must do any of these things. This is because you care about changing the work environment that you're in or the company mission, or you wanna be a happier person at work by having that happier environment. You care about your coworkers having a happier environment, but you don't have to do this. This is work. This is probably outside of your job description, but you can do this stuff. That's why you're here is to learn how. Um, I'm not going to cover today when to leave a bad situation. That's what we covered last week. It was recorded, and we will include the recording link to it in our post-event email if you want to check the last week's out. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to cover that. I'm assuming you want to improve the culture where you're at. I'm um, going to talk a lot about like permission and things like that, but you are responsible for empowering yourself. In this context, what we're talking about here you have to tell yourself you can, you're allowed to do these things. I'm telling you too, you have the power, grab it. Here, I threw it. Did you catch it? 
right? <laughs> I like this quote here. If not you, then who? If not now, then when? You can make these changes as soon as now, assuming you have all the time and energy. Right. Um, a lot of these, you can do both showing and telling. You can say things to change, but it's often even more powerful if you do the things and you model that behavior. Another principle here is focusing on what's possible. It's really easy for us to focus on things that we can't do, that we're implicitly or explicitly prohibited from doing. And I wanna refocus on what things you can do, what things you, you can change in your sphere of influence. All right, a little bit more about permission and power. Power dynamics, uh, I would be remiss not to mention this. If you're in a lower power position, like this, tar this talk is targeted at people who are in lower power positions, like individual contributors, not the executives. If you're an executive here, I'm glad to have you, but the examples will be focused on individual contributors. For lower, position, lower power position people, making change is harder because you have less power to do so. But the higher power positions, executives and managers don't have as much context. So it's harder for them to have that context. So you each have something that the other one doesn't in terms of making this change possible and effective. I have a lot to say about this. We'll have a couple slides on it. Asking for forgiveness is a pretty good principle here. If you can get away with these changes and then show that they're effective, that's often more possible than asking for permission and then you might get a no and then you can't do it. Uh, here's a framework I think of a lot. This is a generic form and I'll show you a more specific one for today's talk on the next slide. On the x-axis here, it's someone opposing your idea, your culture change that you wanna make happen or someone supporting it. And so someone is on that spectrum, they either support it strongly or, or not somewhere in that line. And then on the y-axis, proactive, reactive, passive is how active they are toward it. So like low active, very passive is in the bottom and high active, like proactive doing it without even being prompted is at the high end. And often it's hard to see progress when you move an opposer from being proactive to just reactive. If they stop talking about it as, as often on their own and then they only talk about it when it comes up, that's progress. It's invisible progress. It's hard to celebrate, but I encourage you to any movement along this kind of path is helpful for getting your ideas to happen. All right, here's the more specific one to today's talk. If you are trying to change a uh, social policy, a norm, the, the things that people do, it goes from on the one side forbidden, things, some things are forbidden and some things are encouraged. And if you wanna change something from being explicitly forbidden to being explicitly encouraged, you might go through this path. You might end up weakening how explicitly forbidden it is and then later improving it on the other end. There's multiple paths. This isn't the only path, but this is a pretty common one. And it's, I want you to celebrate if you can get anywhere along this path further along to your goal. Um, also, sometimes this x-axis is flipped. Sometimes you want to forbid things, like you want to forbid your coworkers from making microaggressions. Not everything. We don't try to allow every single thing. But a lot of the examples are like, I want this to be allowed. That's like the more common side. By the way, I made these slides on my iPad. I've been nerding out with my Apple Pencil and Affinity Designer, which is not an Adobe product, I'm proud to say. It's a lot of fun to make these. Um, here, just to put that last slide in words, you can go from explicitly forbidden to implicitly forbidden to, I don't know, totally unclear, I threw in there somewhere. And like, you, you can make steps along this line. I'd like you to apply this image, this framework here, these two axes, to an example that you shared earlier, or someone else's example, or one of mine is okay too. Did the permission change over time? Did something become forbidden, less forbidden, kind of permitted, kind of encouraged? Like, did it move that way or the other way? And did it become more or less explicit, implicit over time? What was that path like? Uh, if you want to describe the x-axis as one sentence and the y-axis as another, that's okay too. Or if you want to describe the whole thing, however you say it in words in English, I'll give you a couple of minutes to try to describe yours using this framework in the sidebar. Timer is set.
Okay, 30 more seconds. And time. I want to call out a great comment from the sidebar chat. Scott mentioned it can be hard to use this diagram when you're thinking about the whole situation, which is totally true. I think of this point as a person in a context. So this person on this team in this environment, that's plotable. I can think about that on these two axes. But then once it's those 10 people involved and what do they each think? or like on this team versus that team, it might be explicit or implicit and it all varies. And that's like a lot of points. I'm a very like data-minded person and it can be harder to do that with more people. Cool, I, I heard another, another couple comments mentioned, we didn't end up getting to make the change because there wasn't enough buy-in to even try it. And I, yeah, in that case, I'm imagining this point kind of stays put and you're trying to nudge it and it's not really moving. And you might redirect your efforts elsewhere, unfortunately. Cool. Gonna move on. Here's another model that we'll link to. I'm not gonna have you do an activity for this one. I'm not gonna dig into it too much. I have another workshop about this one, but this is from a paper about cow farts. That's how I like to describe it. And how do you change the ecological impact of cow farming, of dairy farming? And there are these five levers they came up with based on another model, based on another model. And I like this model a lot. These are like the five core motivators when you're trying to change a system and change social norms. Um, I'll go through each of those four or five at the bottom here. It's called the reset model. Rules. Yeah, literally, I said cow farts. You heard me right. If cows fart, it releases CO2, which goes to global warming, unless we feed them better food and then they don't. But how do we do that? We can change the rules. But it might help if there's an economic tie to that, like a ticket gets a fine. Um, we can educate people on the better alternatives. Maybe they're cheaper and better in every way. They just don't know about it. There's social pressure, like everyone else is doing it. Why don't you do it too, cow farmers? And there's another one is tools and processes. Um, like if they have an ability to visualize the thing, I think about for a DEI program at a company, if you don't even know who's in your hiring pipeline, you can't track how effective you are at getting a diverse hiring pipeline. So like that kind of process. Or I also put in that bucket, like if we have a retro every week on Friday, that's kind of a tool, that's a process that fits into that. So all of these things help motivate changes to happen. I would love to talk to you about this for a whole hour, but that's another talk. And I'm gonna come back and ground ourselves in concrete things you can do as an IC to change the culture. Uh, if you're curious about this, you can look it up from the notes later. I did not make an activity for that because there was no time. All right, next up, a model of change. Um, if you wanna make a, a social change happen, like uh, I really wanted at a, last, at a past company to have people have lunch together. Some people sometimes to have lunch together, that that's not weird that we could talk to each other over lunch. Not everybody, I wouldn't force people to do it, but I didn't wanna eat at my desk alone personally. And other people I talked to didn't either. So we had to like get our schedules to line up or whatever and then we did it once. I had one lunch with one person and we scheduled it and then we did it another time and then we did it again and we started doing it. And then people knew, oh, they have lunch together. That's a thing that happens here. That's the way that they have lunch. So like one step at a time made that happen. And after we had lunch once, I wouldn't have celebrated. I've, I'm victorious in changing the culture of lunch at this company. No way. But I definitely made a step toward that goal. Um, another Part of this is if you're gonna do these steps toward the goal, you can do the pilot test idea. Like I had lunch once with that person and then share, oh, over lunch, I talked about this thing on this other project and it helped with this business outcome. And isn't that so good sharing the results of that one thing. And when we do it a lot, share the results of the pattern and say, it's so good when we do this. I just feel better the rest of the day once I've talked to a human at work, it helps my mood. Uh, so like sharing the results is another powerful lever we have here, telling the story 
another way I say this is storytelling. For cultural change, storytelling is so powerful. And when you have a good track record for the changes you're suggesting, having these good storytelling moments and good results, you end up with more trust and more freedom to try other things. So sometimes like the lunch example, I made lunch happen at this company on some level. And then another social change I wanted to make, like let's not deploy on Fridays. I had a little bit more clout to do that because my ideas have a proven track record and were, people were more open to that. All right, next uh, I'm gonna talk about adoption of change. So this is, for example, I wanted to get everyone at the company to end up eating lunch in the lunchroom. That's like my goal, not 100%, maybe like 90% of people, pretty high goal. I think about this adoption curve, which you might've seen before. It's often used to talk about, I think the, the standard example I learned was the iPhone. Some people had the iPhone very early, like Blackberry users, smartphones in general. Blackberry users had it, but there were very few people and they kind of were trailblazers of this movement. And on the other end, there's like my mom's best friend. She's an older woman and she has a flip phone still. Which suits her very well, thank you. And she is like the laggard on the end there and maybe never gonna adopt it. And for any change, it's slow at first until it hits like an inflection point. And then it seems like everybody's doing it all of a sudden. I have some more examples of this. Here is an XKCD comic and it has both interracial marriage in red and gay marriage in blue, same-sex marriage. This is interesting to me. I really, I found this out when I was researching for this presentation that interracial marriage was legal, the solid line, before it was popular in the like, in opinion polls. And on, it was the opposite for same-sex marriage. It was popular, people supported it before it became legal. So this is like the explicit is like the legal side and the implicit is like the social side here. And both ways happen. Although as an individual contributor, often the implicit social path, I think is probably more likely to work out for you than because you can't just make the rules for the team all the time if you're not a manager or a positional authority, but both, both happen. I also want to point out, um, it's not that clear in this diagram, but this one shows it. It can be very slow for uh, same-sex marriage here. Like in 2000, there was zero and then it went up to one and then it stayed at one for a long time. Then it got to two states that supported it and it got up a little bit by a little bit. And this is gradual change. And then at some point, and the inflection point happens and takes off. And so when you're making a social change at work, you might be here in 2005 where it feels like nothing's going. You got your one friend to have lunch with you and that's it. But the longer you keep at it, it might end up panning out or it might not. You might burn out and change companies before that happens. It happens. Um, but it's up to you to decide, is, is that something that you prioritize and you want to work on and accept slow progress like this? Or if it's not worth it, that's okay too. I hope this is like inspiring, not like depressing that it's going to take so long to make changes, but like small changes over time are actually really effective at getting change to happen. It's just hard to appreciate and see and visualize. And that's like the number one thing I want you to take away today is that if you're nudging culture, you're making progress, you're helping. All right, uh, another idea here from those diagrams, I want you to take away is you can start with supporters. So I started with my friend who I had lunch with, that person I knew also wanted to have lunch at, on, uh, in the office. And then other people who were more inclined to have lunch. I did not start with the people who said, I will never have lunch with others. I will only eat at my desk. I did not start with them. I started with everybody else. And eventually they did join us at lunch once or twice, once it was more of a social norm at the company. All right, uh, when you're trying to affect this change through the population of people at work, like everyone I wanted to have lunch with, there's all these different mediums. You can share ideas, especially for the education angle of it. Like they need to learn that cow farts affect the CO2 in the air. Um, Different mediums work for different people. Some people will not read that book you recommend to them, but they might watch that video if you all do it after stand-up for 15 minutes. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different mediums. There's also different audiences you can target. You could target the one coworker like I did. Or you can have a group opt-in, like a small group change, or you can have everybody mandatory. Maybe that's a later step for a lot of things. And like you hear, you're like, if there's a hundred people, like icons and another visual I didn't draw, 100 people and you just get it to one more and then one more and then a small group more and then you're, you're, you're on that ramp going up. 
you hear me say this a lot. You got to celebrate progress as you go. Or you're going to get burnt out and demoralized. If something went from very low to kind of low and you wanted it to be high, great. That's awesome. You made progress. It's some movement toward that goal. And you can toot this horn everywhere. You can announce it at meetings. You can tell people in one-on-ones. You can send an email or a Slack message and say, we made a change here. Here's the outcome. Or if it failed, you can share that too and just be like transparent about your process. And that gives you more credibility also. Uh, all right, another concern when you're making change at an organization is, is it, will it be long-term? Will it be resilient and last beyond me? And a lot of people I know, like consultants who do a great job making a change, like we don't deploy on Friday at this company now, great, good job consultant, thank you for helping us change that norm. But then when they leave, it reverts right back to where it was. And so as you're approaching this, how can you make it more resilient and more long-term? That's a concern I always have. I wanna be like Mary Poppins. I wanna change the lunch culture at this company, leave and they're still having lunch. Um, how to make it a resilient change. Maybe the biggest rule of thumb is to include people in the process. If people, other people are included, it doesn't depend on you pushing it forward. So the more supporters you can recruit, like that curve in the diagram, getting more people to be on board, you can distribute it. And that is more likely to persist. I can give a whole nother talk on how to make long-term change stick. I don't want to dig into that anymore today. All right. I'm talking a lot. I want to take a break here. Any questions that came up so far before I dive into these 30 concrete actions, things you can do at work to nudge culture? I'm also going to catch up on the chat. Oh, thank you, Katie. I see. I say I see a lot and don't even realize it. I see as individual contributor, which is like any engineer or designer who's not managing people. Or some managers spend half their time doing the IC work of like programming or something like that and half their time managing. And then they have the IC hat and the manager hat both. There was one question from way earlier that I, I wanted to bring up. Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the person, but I did write it down. So it was about asking for forgiveness. Um, and this person gets stuck about the idea of asking for consent and including on others. Mm. So I wanted to know if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I don't want to ask them to share the specific example, but I'm sure there's context that I'm missing and I'm not going to get it right for that context that they're in exactly. But a rule of thumb that that reminded me of is um, informing people you're doing a change and giving them the chance to object. Mm. I, that's a tactic I like to use a lot. I'm going to do this thing unless someone objects. On the Greater Than Code is the podcast I co-host and I recently enabled pronouns on the Slack profiles. And we are the kind of podcast and group and Slack community there that would definitely have pronouns. I don't know how we didn't, we missed it. But I didn't just go and do the change on my own without asking. I said, does anyone mind, if no one objects in the next day, I will do this thing that is obviously good and helpful that everybody here would like, unless there's a reason not to, I missed. And I gave people the chance to say it. No one said, I just got thumbs ups and hearts because they were like, yeah, duh, good. But I would not have done that change without like giving those people that space to say something because I didn't want the backlash. I didn't want it to be like inverted later. Or someone really didn't like it. They speak up against it. And I don't want that in the air. I wanted the inclusion and the buy-in of people in the process, but it's also a thing. I knew we needed to do that change and everybody would be on board. It was very, very likely. And I was happy to, so it's like by default, I'm going to do it unless someone says something. And a lot of people end up by default, I'm not doing anything unless I get permission or encouragement. And I'm trying to flip that script here. Like you can do a lot of things and then give people that option to say no. Well, and it also gives you the opportunity to have a conversation about the change and maybe educate somebody that yeah. didn't otherwise have the opportunity. So giving them the, the chance to ask questions or object allows you to come in and maybe find another supporter you might not have had otherwise. Yeah, yeah. Or you might learn context. Like we tried it before and this backlash happened. I want to know that too. I do want to, I'll, I truly want to know if there's a reason why we shouldn't have pronouns, even though I couldn't imagine it. But I know it's possible sometimes when I can't imagine something, there is something. <laughs> My problem was that I couldn't imagine it. Um, making that space and being like truly open to it is a big part of it too. Another um, anti-pattern is when people do that, but they are not willing to change their mind. They're just doing this cover your ass procedure. And I'm going to do this no matter what, but here you may complain about it. And people can see through it if that's really what's going on. Cool. 
Cool. Uh, any other questions? Or any other part of that question that I missed that I not address? Cool. Moving on. 30 concrete actions. I've got a whole bunch of slides that look like this. I'm going to go through them pretty quickly. Uh, you'll also have a copy of the slides in the post event email and we'll put that in the discord if you want to refer back to this or you can take notes as you go. That's pretty good too. On these slides on the left, I'll have a quote, something you might say about the culture at the company. And that's at the context where these are relevant. And then on the right, I'll include some ideas, things to try. Those are the ones I'm counting toward my 30. And sometimes I'll include a term or a concept like propinquity. I'll tell you what that word means in a bit. And then for a lot of these, I have a workshop and I don't want to harp on what I do, but like this is literally my job is helping people do all these changes and I have workshop content for these um, that I'll include on those slides. All right, jumping in. Let's say at my company, people aren't friendly to each other. I used to work somewhere and we would all talk to each other sometimes about our lives and I miss it and I want that now. The thing you could do is you could be that person making that culture happen. You could be like the heart of the team, I think of it. You could be actively friendly, even to the people who aren't actively friendly to you. You can do it anyway. Relentless kindness, I call it sometimes. You can make space for people to be social and to approach you. You can hang out in the lunchroom. Um, a separate idea, which is related but different, is being welcoming to new people. Because when new people come in, they don't know the culture yet. You can be the culture, the face of the culture. It's like, we are very happy and have lunch here. At least me and my few people join us. And then as people join, they, you are influencing the culture way more deliberately than the people who eat at their desk. Yeah, relentless kindness, thank you. <laughs> I love seeing this chat sidebar, seeing what resonates. All right, so those are, those are two. Another thing I hear a lot is, I can't change it myself. And we covered this before in a concept, but I just wanna, this is an action too, empowering yourself. You can do this. You can write it on a sticky note like, I can try to nudge this change to happen. Like affirm, affirm yourself, give yourself that support. Um, you don't need positional authority to make social changes at least. All right, next. Um, in Agile, the Agile Manifesto, they say we should people over process. Like we should concern ourselves with the people involved and what their needs are and what we're going for over the process and just follow the rules because the rules are there. I love that, but a lot of companies do the opposite. They do process over people. These are the rules, even if they're dumb and make really negative outcomes for the business, we must follow them. Whew. I can give a whole talk on this too. All right, some things you can do in response to that. You can influence your local bubble. You can influence those six people on the project team you're on. You can influence the other five product managers. If you have a product management team you can talk to. Um, you can change the process on a small team way easier than on a big team. Like how you can change same-sex marriage in a state earlier than you can change it for the entire United States. You can, you can make small change and that's progress toward the goal too, team by team. Uh, same pattern as person by person. Another one here, focus on the highest priority things to change. You can't change it all at once. And if you try to make the culture, the ideal perfect culture in your image all at once, you're gonna get burnt out, it's too much. Even founders, and they have all the power, can't make the culture be what their image of the culture should be. They can't do it. Culture is a living, breathing thing. All the people involved are contributing to it. Uh, but you can pick some things that matter to you, like having lunch, for me it was, and get that to happen. Uh, another one is if there's a dumb rule, why do we not deploy on Fridays? Our CI pipeline is so good. We don't have any problems when we roll out. We have the staging server, it's all great. This is dumb for us. We should be able to deploy it on Fridays. Um, you can advocate for the concrete alternative. Like if it does end up crashing and we have an alert set up and we'll know that we're having a less stable build, then we can stop deploying on Fridays, something like that. Like if you can be more concrete about what the alternative would look like, people can think about it. But if they can't imagine the alternative, like it's just, just increased risk and I don't know what to do about it, people will be stuck there. Yeah, all right, next. Uh, people will say, we just don't naturally interact with each other. We don't see each other. Like I used to in the office, we would see each other in the hallway and at lunch. And now I don't, because we're online. It happens a lot, remote especially. Here's a term I love to talk about, 
propinquity. This is a psychology term that means social closeness, as in I see this person in the lunchroom every day and we talk about stuff every day, even though they live two hours from me and we both commute an hour to the office. Like we're not, we don't physically aren't in nearby each other. We see each other a lot. Or someone who's in Europe and I'm in the US, but I see them in the fluffy chat, Slack chat room and we all share pictures of dogs together. I'm much closer to them than the neighbor across the hall in the apartment building. I've never seen them. I don't know who they are. Is there someone who lives there? I don't know. Uh, so like naturally bumping into people in social spaces is propinquity, the more, the more propinquity. So I have a lot of ideas for social chat rooms on Slack, Teams, and Discord. Um, there's a Twitter thread I'll post with 20 of my favorite fun Slack chat rooms where people can end up talking to each other. And one example is the hi chat room, hashtag hi, and you can only say hi. But I still feel connected to all those other people. We literally only ever said hi to each other. But when I see them at a tech event, a meetup, I'm like, we say hi. <laughs> you know, that, that's a connection point. All right. Um, another, I bumbled on this in the same one is online socials. Like if you can do a Jackbox night with your team once ever, you know, it could really in, improve how much you feel like you know each other and you trust each other and can work together better. All right, another one, retros. You might do some retros. You could do more retros. If you do a retro every week for your small team, you might not do a retro for your bigger team of 30 people ever. Maybe you could do those monthly or quarterly something and then those people can end up seeing and talking to each other more. Or after a project, I like the project end retros too. Whew. All right, another is talking across groups of people and teams, uh, affinity groups. Like I, I always join the queer channel and anytime I'm in a Slack. There's usually a queer channel if it's big enough. I also like to join the gamers channel, even though I don't play PS4, I kind of know what they're talking about and I can talk about the PC games I play. There's also a pet owner channel often, a whole bunch of channels. And this is valuable. I have a, a short story, a friend worked for a different government agency from me and they were trying to get rid of their high channel. The people in charge said, this cannot be providing value and it must go. And thankfully the CTO defended it. And they were like, no, this provides a lot of value thanks to this channel and these people knew each other, this project went better and they had to point to things. Like, unfortunately, they didn't have the trust to just do it anyway, but um, it literally provides value and you could measure it if you had to. All right, next, um, I never know what other teams are doing. And that makes it hard to talk to people in the other teams. You don't, you don't even know the words that are coming out of their mouth. I don't know what that software is they're working on. Um, ideally, this one, I like it if um, leadership sets it up, but I have done it on my own too. I got my team of six people to share what we're doing. We made a big presentation. Here's all the features from the past six months. Who wants to come hear what we're doing? We did a call out to other people and very optional, small opt-in thing. People came and that was a precursor to us doing a more bigger one because people saw the value of it. People would say, oh, I know what they're doing because they did a demo day. And even you as an IC can start this idea. Even if it's super small, you can invite one person from the other team you can demo things to them, like however you can get it started. And if you start it, you can encourage them to do it for you too. I wanna to know what you all are working on. Can you share it? That's another idea. All right, another, people don't trust each other and slash, we don't have great rapport. Like I know them, I know, I know that their mom lives in Kentucky, but I don't feel like I can talk to them and we don't connect. Um, individual connections are super important here. I want to call it like people connect with other people. It's like the most important kind of connection. You might connect with a team, a group of people, but you're really connected with the individuals on the team also. For this, I encourage people to do one-on-ones. Um, you might have a one-on-one -on -one with your manager. Ideally, you should. At some frequency, that's really valuable. You might not have heard of this one, skip level. You can meet with your boss's boss. And that's a normal thing at a lot of companies. And you can say so. I've gotten skip levels by saying, I've never worked at a company that didn't have skip levels. And then they were they're like, oh, oops, yeah, this does sound good and we'll do it now, thanks. That was a positive outcome, thankfully. You can also have one-on-ones with peers on your team. I encourage you all to have that with everyone you work with often, at least one one-on-one -on -one once. And people on other departments across the company, you can like reach out to random people who seem approachable and talk to them. And they're pretty valuable too. Another technique a lot of companies do is donut. Donut is an app you can plug into Slack and it randomly matches anyone in a Slack chat room to each other and says, you're going to talk now. 
I feel like two thirds of people end up following through talking and that's okay. It still adds, adds a lot of connections uh, across the company that are pretty valuable. Another tool is Shuffle. Good, good. Yeah, every platform's got to have one of these at this point. I, don't, I wouldn't believe it if they didn't have one. All right, and, um, and of course I have some workshops on this that I do that I'm not gonna dig into their content today either. Next, some people say, I don't feel supported here. Nobody gets me. No one knows what I'm working on or what bothers me and what concerns me. And people need support. People, humans in psychology studies depend on having other people understand them and what their perspective is to be happy and satisfied and effective. It's a human thing, we need it. You can ask for support. It is a skill, asking for support is its own skill that unfortunately doesn't get trained that often. You can ask for support from a manager, from a teammate, from other peers in your role, from people across the org you don't even talk to, they just seem approachable. They might support you too. They might find it very satisfying to support another person in this similar problem. You can also offer support to others and start that norm of having people give and receive support to each other. You can say, I'm available, um, it's COVID, but I do have some social bandwidth lately to talk to people if you want to, I'm available. You can make yourself available to people or reach out even better to an individual. Hey, if you wanna talk sometime, you seem frustrated and I'm happy to talk about it. You could be that person. You could proactively, proactively reach out and offer support. All right, next. We do great work, but it doesn't feel like it. Here, um, you can nudge the culture to be more into celebrating positive things. Some cultures just don't celebrate positive things by default. They didn't make space for it and there's no time for it and there's no habit, there's no muscle developed. One uh, pattern I like is the kudos channel or some people just do it in the general channel. Everybody can see it then. Great job on this thing, it was awesome. It doesn't hurt to celebrate things like that. Some people say it's too much clutter. No, it's like so valuable. And they wouldn't say that if you said it about them. Good job. <laughs> the person who doesn't like that I say good job. <laughs> um, another pattern I like is sharing release notes. Like we did these cool things. We ship these features, ship it somewhere. You can put it in the general channel if it's not too big or your own channel that like you work with stakeholders and collaborators in. We did these things. Or like this person fixed a gnarly database bug. It's so cool, thank you. You can be the person to start that. Start the trend. And another one is the town hall demo day presentations we talked about before. If you can like showcase your work there, another way to do it. Whew, so many ideas. I hope some of these are resonating with y'all. I see some nods and smiles for a bunch of these different people and different ones, which is what I expected too. All right, people don't always share what they're thinking here. You can encourage people to share. So if someone does make an observation you don't understand, imagine you respond with this. What do you mean? Could you tell us more about that? I think the main reason you might not is if there's not time in the meeting, you could do it after the meeting, reach out to them and ask them to explain it. Um, or often, honestly, if I have the urge to ask them, what do they mean? That's more valuable than the meeting agenda content, in my opinion. And so I try to nudge for that cultural change a lot of the time. Uh, there's also another skill. Oh, I didn't make that an icon. Another workshop I do for explicit validation saying, it makes sense. You would think that based on your background and this context that you're in and you're missing this context I have, by the way, but it makes sense. You would think that I'm with you then. And it's a skill therapists get taught and non-therapists don't get taught, unfortunately, until now I try to popularize this idea. It's so powerful. So, so powerful. Um, another idea here is modeling being vulnerable saying, I don't know that thing. And if you can say that other people can start saying it. This is a lot. I'm gonna take a drink and let you all rest your ears for a moment here. All right, next thing that comes up a lot, this is another cultural norm of managers don't make space to get feedback. I know what they're doing wrong and they're frustrated about it, but I'm not gonna be the one to tell them because they're not gonna take it from me. How can you nudge that situation so that they are more receptive to feedback? You can, you don't have to, it's not your job to manage your manager, but you can influence it. One thing that helps here a lot is to realize most managers aren't trained. Most managers went from being an engineer to an engineering manager, for example, and that's it, the end. Maybe their director or whoever's above them gives them some tips sometimes, but a lot of people don't get training. 
And so here, you know the secret now. This, these are two things they need to know about how to get feedback. Uh, they need to make space for it. Like they can ask a question during a one-on-one. -on -one. What feedback do you have for me? I'm open to it in this moment. They can ask for that space. Another one is a lot of managers don't realize how their position makes it harder for others to share feedback. They're, now they're in a higher power position. They knew this very well when they were ICs, when they were individual contributors, they knew it. But once they're a manager, they don't realize that shift and how dramatically it affects things. You can help them understand that too. Um, that might look like saying, um, I hesitated to tell you this. You can be vulnerable in that way. But since you're asking in this moment, the space that you just created, I'll tell you, but I hesitated because you're my boss and it's important that you make space like this. Um, and I have a whole workshop on giving and receiving feedback like that. All right, next. Um, people here follow the rules even where it doesn't make any sense. I, <laughs> it's a whole workshop on this too. This is one of the three Western cultural types. There's power oriented, rule oriented, and like outcome oriented. We all want to work on the outcome oriented team. It's better for the business and for us, but there are rule oriented environments. And um, one way that kind of helps nudge out of that is trying experiments. Uh, maybe the third one here I'd start with first. What's the shared goal? What does everybody agree to? We want to change this thing. We want to help the customers with this problem, which also makes us revenue, sure. And that's the goal. You can try experiments. Like, what if we did this thing and it helped or not? And framing it as an experiment, that word is magic in a lot of contexts. Once I say experiment, people say, oh, sure. We can try it once and then we'll see it doesn't work and you'll stop bringing it up. Good, good. And it might work anyway, though, of course. Another thing is I like to ask, what happens if we do X? What happens if we don't build that entire feature that will take three months? Well, how does that affect the business? Um, it's like the five whys idea. And it's hard to do this tactfully, but when I do manage to get through and get to the root of something, it's really powerful. All right, next. Let's say you're in an environment that's not inclusive. It doesn't help include introverts, people who talk more slowly and need more space before they talk. It doesn't support people who are queer like me or who are black or any, any of those that it's just not an inclusive environment. What can you do to help? You can help nudge the local bubble that you're in, of course. You can help people learn. You can tell people one-on-one, -on -one, work with them. Uh, there's studies that show HR PowerPoint slides don't work. And I mean, duh, we all knew that the whole time. <laughs> They're terrible. But if you have a discussion with people about the same content and talk about how it applies to your work and actual examples that would come up or have come up for you, that does work actually to help people change and be more inclusive. A lot of people just aren't even aware of the problems other people face. And once they're aware, they can start working on it. I have a lot of workshops about inclusion, but you can do it without even workshops by discussing it with people in groups or one-on-ones, or you can imagine this, you can ask for training. If there's an affinity group in particular, that's an easy way to ask. An affinity group can advocate for that kind of thing really well. Like the queer affinity group at one company could bring in a speaker about queer culture and invite non-queer people to it so they can learn. You can also ask HR for it, or you can ask your manager for it, or probably you have to ask all three to get it done if it's something you care about. But then if you wanna get this training in, you can advocate for it. Leadership on their own is not likely to advocate for it if they're not experiencing the problem themselves. That's like a core issue of inclusions. The people in power are not the people who aren't included. And so it requires the lower power people to advocate for this change. Yeah, psychological safety is related. All right, next, um, I'm not sure who's supposed to be doing what here. This is an opportunity to identify what the implied social arms are. Um, like who is doing that thing? Who is running the meetings right now, whether they're supposed to or not? Who is? Um, writing tests or reviewing pull requests or anything like that, who is doing it? And you can work on making them explicit today. That's how I like to start that process and then change that over time. So you, the IC could just ask, I would like to better understand who reviews pull requests and how that works. Who can talk to me about it? And then write it down and make it explicit. And like, that's a thing you can nudge forward. And then once you write it down, maybe that step that you knew didn't make sense is now like very blatant and you can point to it. What about this step three here that doesn't make any sense? All right, um, so making it explicit helps people iterate on it. It makes the problem more visible. So you can work on making things explicit. All 
right, next, um, people don't always understand what I'm trying to communicate. I want to tell them this thing and they don't get it. The biggest concept here that I think of is the curse of knowledge, which you experience at times when you know something that someone else doesn't know. And you can't imagine not knowing it anymore. That time is gone. You used to not know it, but now you do. And somehow the brain just can't teleport back to that area. Those neuron connections are gone. Um, so if you can like model curiosity and figure out where they are from their perspective, like, oh, what do you understand about the situation? What's it like from your perspective? And asking questions, like a Socratic approach, asking Socrates is famous for asking questions to say things kind of, to make points, to get the other person to think the right things. That can help here. Instead of saying, you should think my way, say, what about this thing that I have in my mind? And it might be different. All right. Uh, another one is becoming aware of your own biases. That's just one, but there is 100 plus cognitive biases that are all well documented with experiments and ways that you can adapt to it. That's its own workshop too. Have you ever felt this? I feel crazy. I feel like I'm going insane here. I'm the only one who sees this problem. No one else sees it. Um, I hope you can get support because you deserve that kind of support for this perspective. Uh, whether you're right or not doesn't even matter, honestly, but if no one can understand where you're coming from, that's its own problem that, that is worth addressing. You can find someone who just supports you in general, asking for support is very related to that. Um, find a, a peer on the team who might get it in a one-on-one -on -one, or find someone across the company who's been there a long time and seen this pattern maybe, or someone outside of work. Um, like a lot of my coaching clients tell me problems. They say at the end, they just feel better about it. Because I, I understand the problem, the way they're framing it to me. I'm like, yeah, I'd feel upset about that. And they can go in with a clearer head to the discussion the next day and say, da, 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 you know, like more balanced because they're understood. You deserve to feel understood. And you can get that by reaching out to the right people. All right, next. Um, by the way, just time check. We have half an hour left. I'm almost done with these. And then we're going to switch into Q&A mode. Um, some of our events are one hour, so I wanted to make that clear just in case you're a frequent attendee. All right, uh, nobody asks for my input until it's too late. I hear this the most. The common example is the engineers aren't involved in the design process, and then the design comes. We can't build that. That's impossible, or it will take us six months to build it, and that is not what you're telling us, the timeline we have. Um, I've managed to be the engineer getting in on the design process before, too, by on the next project, I have to like ask, what projects might be coming up, manager? Anything you know about that's down the pipeline that they might not have thought to offer to tell me? And then, oh, could I get involved in that earlier? And who's the designer on it? And then I'll talk to them and I'll like, hey, designer, I heard you're working on this project someday and I want to be involved earlier. And they are happy to have me earlier. Nobody thought to invite me though until I invited myself. And then once the pattern was set and there is an engineer on this and it was great and they can tell that story of celebration and then there's a pattern of it, changes the culture over time. You could be the person to barge in and be that, that first example of an engineer being in the design process. All right, that was my 30. There were 30 light bulbs on all those slides. I hope you can take some of them away to practice. Um, before I talk about outro slides, I guess, I want to ask a question. I didn't make a slide for it. Forgive me. I like to have all my slides ready, but what's one of these actions that stuck with you or a thing you might try? I'll set a timer and I want you to share in the sidebar chat. I might try this thing. I might try making the hashtag high channel or one of those. I'll slowly go through these slides one more time in case you want to pull one out. Um, being the heart of the team, being welcoming to new people, empowering myself. Focusing on my local bubble, focusing on the highest priority specifically, alternatives for dumb rules, remote uh, social chat rooms, more retros, more groups where people can talk like a chat room or something like that, demo day, getting other people to do demo days, having more one-on-ones with who would you have a one-on-one -on -one with? There's lots of options here. Asking for support from who would you ask for support from? Offering support, who would you offer support to? The kudos channel, sharing celebrations, where would you share them? What channel, what medium, what email list? Uh, demo day again. Um, 
modeling curiosity, modeling vulnerability, helping your manager make space to receive feedback. Oh, what a big one. <laughs> Using the word experiments for things, asking what happens if we do that? Focusing on the shared objectives, helping people learn about inclusivity concepts. Which ones, who, how, when? Working on identifying implicit social norms on your team, like how things are working, like writing out the current state of things. Modeling curiosity, um, becoming aware of your biases, finding people who get it to support me. Whew, I'm just, there's so many here. And I feel, I feel like I've done all these and it is exhausting. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of time and energy, but I'm proud. A lot of these changes that I'm sharing, I've done at companies and I like to check in a year or two later. They're still going. There's still a PM community of practice at my last job. That took a year to get ready to get the group of PMs to talk to each other every other week. It took a lot of work. And I'm so proud they're still going because it adds a lot of value. All right, I'm looking at this sidebar. Demo day, safe space, high channel. Making space for feedback and propinquity and doing experiments, love it. All right, there was I'm gonna one, do... Sorry, yeah. there was one question, Casey. Um, I believe it was Lee that asked if, um, yeah, if like coming off pushy, if you're trying to be included in the design process as a developer. Um, so like what's some advice around like doing that in a way where it feels like you're adding as opposed to being pushy. Yeah. I think it's a great question. Mm -hmm. Great question. There are times when all of my advice here today doesn't apply. And if you do it, it'll be terrible and backfire and you'll be more upset. And I'm so sorry. The world is like that. It's true. I didn't focus today on whether it's appropriate in your situation to stay and work on it or leave to a better, healthier environment for you. Because I focused on that a lot last week. But if you think speaking up and doing these changes would get backlash, you might not want to do it. It might not be worth your time and energy and effort. And it might not pan out anyway. And it might be, it might work better in another environment. Okay, but let's say that it does apply here and you do want to do things and how can you be tactful about it? I think that comes down to a lot of like interpersonal skills and rapport with the person. So if you have an idea and the person's not going to receive it well, maybe you can focus on your relationship with the person, getting to know them better, and that will help them be more receptive to you suggesting things, uh, which is a slow game. It might not be what you're looking for in my answer, but it's the thing that works is to try to develop the rapport with people. Yeah, thank you so much, Katie, for calling out this question. Thank you, Lee, for asking it. I'm looking back to make sure I didn't miss any others, but I'm sure Katie, actually, you were, you were always on this. Yeah, I, uh, I, I put, I copied and pasted any questions that didn't get answered during of the time. Course. So we, um, it was thank only you. those two. The first one I popped in on the second one, you were pretty good about answer them as they came in. But sometimes there was a lot of chat happening and somebody's questions got yeah. pushed mm -hmm. aside. So I wanna make sure those got answered. Teamwork. All right, I'm gonna go through some of these outro slides and then mm -hmm. I'll switch over to like Q and A. And I encourage you all for the Q and A part to unmute and voice your question out loud and it can be more of a discussion. Um, and a lot of people drop off and we do the Q and A part and that's fine if you gotta go do stuff, that's okay. But the questions that come up are usually pretty interesting for talks like this. I know I didn't cover everything. All right, some outro slides. I do, this is my full-time job. I got tired of being asked to do dumb stuff at so many companies. And I know how to make things better and please let me do it. I figured out eventually that it's easier to do that as a consultant where people are open and interested in having these changes happen. And that's my job now, I love it. I do uh, an organizational assessment, which is like a report that I do after I interview and survey people. And I do this in Python, I love it. It's a very nerdy of me. I love doing all the statistics on it. and. Uh, that's one thing. Another one is coaching. I coach a bunch of executives and PM, product managers, engineering managers. I do workshop series like this one. Some companies ask me to do it like one every month. Um, HR departments in particular have to do some number of DEI workshops. It's like part of their expectations. And so they are looking for people like me. If you like this talk, feel free to recommend me to that HR person. Um, I also work with some teams where I consult with them and I just, whatever makes sense, whatever meetings to go to or one-on-ones to have, I just really help make things change. And I also do that after an organizational assessment. 
because then I, I'm like, you have these three problems, which I know how to help. And they say, actually, sure, you do know what they are. <laughs> um, some of my specialties as a consultant are team effectiveness, getting a team of like six-ish people to really work together well and gel and be very effective. Um, team and company alignment. So as a product manager, especially, I had a lot of experience with that. The team often says, we're being asked to do dumb stuff, but the leadership knows why it makes sense and they're not communicating it well. Or the leadership says, the teams aren't listening to us. Um, and they need to communicate that better. Or the people on the team see stuff that's going on the leadership needs to know. And so getting that communication path to go is one of my specialties. Another is couples counseling and quotes. I'm not, a, I'm not a certified therapist, even though I wrote a book about a therapy practice. I never went through the certification process and I'm okay with that, I don't want to. But I do that style of counseling for founders and executives. I've worked with a bunch of startups. And another one, um, product skills training. And that's true for team leads and product managers both. Team leads need a lot of the product manager skills, it turns out, like prioritizing. Even the engineering backlog deserves to be prioritized deliberately. And that's the kind of thing I specialize in. Someone, I'm so flattered. Someone told me this is the best report of how the company and employees are doing they've ever seen. I, several people. I don't like bragging, but as a consultant, I'm supposed to. And I, I, I can hear Nyota and Katie saying, you have to, you have to. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, all right, that's enough about me. I'm going to turn off the slides here. And it's Q&A time. Yeah, weirdly, I'm responding to a message Lee posted, being a consultant, people listen to you when you're a consultant in a way they do not listen to employees. And we might not like it. I feel like as an employee, you should respect my perspective and opinion. I've been here three years. Come on now. But the studies show and consultants know that just being an outside voice that they're paying a lot of money to makes people listen to you more. <laughs> I'd rather transform companies from the inside like I've been trying to do, but it hasn't panned out and it works much better as a consultant for better or worse. And uh, honestly, a lot of the times when I'm consulting for a company, I say literally what the employees are saying. And I tell them, the employees, I'm going to say what you just said and they'll listen to me. I'm sorry about how that is true, but you've got me to amplify your voice now. Uh, I see a hand raised by Lee. I was just going to say oh that. My. Well, hi, well hi, um, Casey. I came in kind of late. I've been in, had had therapy, <laughs> a real life therapy. Um, yeah. That is so amazing what you said about being a consultant and people taking it more seriously. I am blown. I know that seems like, oh, I mean, I don't know, I'm out of it, but how do you even, like, do you just, does it take you years to do that? And how do you, are you available to talk to people in nonprofits and people who are having classes? Like I have peer recovery coach for uh, mental illness and addictions. And I, I need my, my group to gel better. <laughs> yeah. Or communicate I'm, I'm or use to technology. We, should, oh, we sorry, need to talk. I'm sorry, real quick, um, Casey. And people who, who don't use technology, how do I get them on board? Because I seem like I'm just the only one doing all the work. <laughs> yeah. We have so much to talk about. I can't wait to talk to you later, Lee. Um, I'll include, I mean, here's my email. Anyone, you can all feel, feel free to reach out to me if you want. Uh, it also includes my website in the email. If you want to go to the website, check it out, feel free. Um, it does take a while to get started as a small business. And I've been thinking the Empathy and Tech group is a great place to maybe have a, an event, a group where we talk about exactly that. Because a lot of us here involved are consultants or have done consulting or considering doing consulting. And there's so much to share. I'm so thankful I found support from Nyota and Katie and Andrea and a whole bunch of others, Scott too. Um, and I love the small business movement too, being a small business owner. Like we need more of that in the US. It is a good trend that I'm seeing. Yeah, Nyota, thank you. <laughs> I'll have one email from my own at least. Yeah, it blew my mind also when I learned that consultants, it's like my friend sent me a paper, a study that shows consultants get listened to more. And I knew it was true in somewhere in my head. Like it wasn't surprising, but seeing it, I was like, wow. It is not only like known, it is like empirically measured. <laughs> I'm like, we'd better believe it. I saw a question earlier from Todd. Do you credit the employees to try to change that relationship? Yes, as much as possible when they're okay being public about it, because I get a lot of confidential, private, anonymous 
feedback to, and I'll say, employees are saying this thing. And if you know who, because you've talked to them about it, great, but I'm not going to say who, because I'm very concerned about anonymity. Same on my surveys, the survey data I get. If you looked at the full record, if I gave you the raw data, you could tell who's who, because this team, this role, this person, this tenure, I'm not giving that away to anyone. I'm very concerned about privacy. So I do the, my own metrics based on those. And that's what anyone at the company gets is the anonymized results. But as, if I can, if they're public about it, I'll say, you heard this person say that. That's what I'm saying too. And it makes sense. Maybe you didn't listen to them right away, whatever. It makes sense. I'm validating you, validating ex explicitly. And now is a good moment to change now that you, whatever, some situation thing. Whew. Consulting. What other questions do we have? I don't particularly have a question, but I kind of want to hear success stories that people might have had after going through the slides to realize that they might have already made some of these cultural changes at work to hear how it. that kind of went. Because um, it sounds like some people are like, oh, I've done that and that was successful. And um, I, like, I think it'd be really good to hear like how it has worked for others in these real life experiences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you can think of an example from earlier, uh, feel free to unmute the audio and video if you want, or put it in the sidebar chat and we'll read it. And raise your hand if you're maybe not being seen too. There's a, in the reactions on the toolbar at the bottom, you can raise your hand down there and we'll see it. I'm sure all of you can come up with like five things that have worked out. You might not be coming up with it right away here, but you've done things. Everyone's done some amount of these changes. Nyota has raised your hand. <laughs> Don't forget to unmute yourself, Nyota. You already know me. Um, <laughs> um, and the thing, um, and I think you probably, y'all have maybe seen my, you know, talking about leaving from work on time. Like it's easy to have this culture of people are just at work just because they think they're supposed to stay at work. And um, I don't know if you already can tell, like I'm kind of extra a little bit, but like my shutdown process is bananas. Like, I'm like, okay, I am getting ready to leave from work. And I start cleaning up my area. It's like, I might as well sing the song, clean up, clean up, everybody clean. Like I may as well do that because it really does um, make people like, well, sh if she's, if she's leaving and just really giving people that permission, like, and it really does impact, like it really did, did have an impact on my entire unit, right? Cause they're like, whoa, the, the communication section over there, they're leaving for the day, right? And if they're leaving, we should be leaving. And I just think people like um, to, we get to be the example, you know, and, and we get to, and, and not from a place of, you know, trying to manipulate people or anything like that. But when you consider like your own needs, you're not the only one who needs that. So. I love the idea of modeling behavior like that. That's the thing, it, you know, it, I'm not an IC, I am a leader of a company. So oftentimes, you know, it's much easier for me to do things because I get to set the rules, but I find modeling behavior to be super important. So I will often say, you guys might've noticed I worked till like seven last night. I'm leaving at three today because I'm gonna give myself a break. I have also very, very vocally said, I'm taking a mental health day it, and I need a day to just rest and watch really dumb Netflix shows because that's all I have my capacity for. Um, so like modeling, I think is one of the first and easiest ways that you can start to elicit change. Like, I stopped using this for this word because I have found that it's upset people because of this. So I'm just letting you guys know. Or giving kudos in a channel. I worked with somebody and they did this amazing thing. And the more you do it, the more people will do it as well. Um, super, super effective. Uh, it's just modeling behavior. And as I when I became a parent, I realized that that's a parenting tactic as well. So now I just do it all day long with everybody, including this five-year-old that's trying to like, you know, make the entire house out of Legos at this point in time and showing him how you can clean them up and not just step on them in the middle of the night and hurt yourself. <laughs> Scott, I see your hand is raised. Yep. One thing I try to do is I try to normalize like mental health, like you mentioned a mental health day. Um, so like, um, 
you know, we have like written standups that we do within the company. And so like, if I'm going to therapy that day, I'll put it in my standup. I like, I've got therapy today. Um, cause sometimes it, sometimes it affects me. Like sometimes I'm not, I'm not able to work afterwards. Like if it's a really tough therapy day, then, then it's really hard for me to work afterwards. Uh, and just kind of modeling that and just trying to help normalize, you know, mental health. Cause it, you know, it is something that's, that's invisible and has a, you know, still has a stigma. I'll, I'll just go ahead and jump in. Um, so one example that came to mind, um, a few of the points, Casey, that you brought up, like propinquity uh, is not a word I knew, but when I heard it, I was like, oh yeah, that's something that I was concerned about too. Um, and asking for forgiveness instead of permission um, is that I decided that I wanted to do co-working calls with my coworkers, just because a lot of us were just working in silos and not really interacting with each other. Um, and so I just wanted to have a space where we could kind of try and replicate an in-office experience. Um, and it kind of followed the path that you were talking about where it was, at first it was just me and one other person. Um, and then slowly we would talk to other people about it and invite more people and continually remind people we were doing it. And it became something that um, a, a lot more people are doing these days. So I think that was, um, and that's something I was able to do as an IC. I'm not a manager or anything, but just kind of working in my little bubble and trying to expand it uh, was worked out well for that. I love it. What a great story. I can picture it. It's fun, it, Caitlin, I've been doing that as well at work. Um, when I say I would like invite people to pair, it's really just like, hey, does anybody want to sit like in a call with me for an hour while I do stuff? So I can just be like, oh, this thing's frustrating me. Or can I run this by you? Or just telling a joke when it comes up in the moment, just to have that camaraderie. And I make sure when I do that, it is not within my typical department of people I talk to every day. So I reach out to people that I don't see that often. And I'm like, I miss you, or I haven't caught up with you in a while. Can we do like a 20 minute catch up and then just like pair and work together for a little while. And it's been amazing to improve the company transparency. Um, there are things that like, as I sort of pulled myself out of operations more and more, I'm missing out on some things. So I'm able to learn through people like what's working, what's not. And it's actually helped me improve some things at the company because I'm able to talk to somebody who's pretty far removed, but I can still have the opportunity to make their job easier. So it's just like, not only just like an emotional connection that you're getting with, it's also just like randomly helping the company do better because I'm able to hear what's going on. And it allows employees to have bottom up feedback because we've, we've, it took a long time, but we've brought in the culture of like, it's okay to dissent. It's okay to say this isn't working. And like, it's okay to give us ideas, even if it's outside what you normally do. So in those moments, I'm getting a lot of really good bottom up feedback as well. So that's just a, a leadership kind of lens on like what we like to hear as well. So I'm really I'm glad you did that. Casey, I don't know if you saw this one, but Lee's comment about using mental health as an excuse and not coming from a culture of normalizing mental health. Uh, I am familiar with this culture that she speaks of, and I would just love to hear your take on it. Yeah. Uh, I'm a phrase coming to mind is normalizing, talking about mental health. And there's both normalizing in your background, your culture, where you came from that influences how comfortable you are and the work environment could be the same or different than that normalizing it or not. And your team, even in the large company work environment could normalize it or not. And that's a social norm. On all these levels is a social norm. You're allowed to talk about it or not. It's respected if it comes up or not. And if you aren't coming from a background where it's normal to talk about it and your team is not comfortable, I'm not gonna tell you to start talking about it. It's like not, not the most helpful thing, but how can we get the team to be able to talk about mental health effectively? That's my big question. Some of it can come from leadership, if they model this behavior, of course, they have more power and influence than um, the individual contributors do. So you can ask them to model it and how and why and the benefits of it. But if they're not receptive, you might be stuck. That's one of the takeaways here too, is you can't change everything. Nayota, I want to hear what else do you have to add to this? 
oh, do I look like I have something to add? Because I do. <laughs> and, you know, I really liked um, kind of bundling these techniques where you talked about like uh, saying what the results were, where you're like, we go to lunch and we get to handle these things and we address this. So do y'all remember like when I didn't go to mental health and didn't have a therapist last year and how I used to come across the table on everyone and I was so angry? Do you notice how I'm so much different? I'm so receptive to hearing. Like, I think if we could kind of, we get to bundle some of these concepts. And I think that could be helpful because if you notice other people are noticing, but you get to remind them like, I am such a better person and you'll, you have my therapist to thank for this. I love it. Yeah. Uh what to do about any given social norm you want to change varies based on the environment you're in and where you're at and how comfortable you are. Oh, so many variables. So I'm, I'm trying to really give you all a whole bunch of examples and a whole bunch of lenses to use to look at the situation to figure out what you can and can't do and what things to be most effective. And there's no simple answer for any of these. I'm sure that came across some amount, but I feel like I have to keep saying that over and over. Like there's no answer, there's no silver bullet for this stuff. So Nyota's example works after you've had the year of therapy and there are positive results that can be helpful if it's a certain amount comfortable anyway, but if it's a certain amount uncomfortable, you still might not bring that up because it wouldn't be accepted. Yeah, just a few minutes left. Um, I wanna share one more thing is if you're on this call, I'm happy to do one free workshop for your company. All you have to do is get me in touch with the right person who runs trainings. Sometimes it's through an affinity group. Uh, sometimes it's through HR. They do this kind of training centrally and they have to, sometimes a manager does it for their, their team of 30 or team of six, that's happened before. Um, so if you can loop me into somebody, I'll do one free workshop for your company no strings attached. Although a lot of places, like more than half of them end up asking me to do more because the quality is good and they love it and they want to learn more of the stuff because they win-win. And I love doing these. I hear from people a year or two after I do every workshop I do, I hear from somebody eventually saying, the thing you said in this talk helped me do this. And it's just so satisfying. More than at the companies where the feature I worked on for six months never got shipped. That was not as satisfying. This consulting work is so much more satisfying than that. I love that. Thank you so much, Casey. Um, <clears throat> well, we also have in part of the series, um, you know, Casey did last the last event with the with the collaborative series that we've had with Empathy and Tech and General Assembly. Um, and so we'll have that recording soon and we'll, we'll send out an email to everybody with some links that were included in this chat and the recording for this chat. We'll also include last week's recording as well because there is a lot of um, synchrony between, between the two. Um, and then moving forward, we have two more events this month, uh, same time, Wednesday uh, the 20th and Wednesday the 27th. So the next one is taking the leap and finding your exit strategy. Um, so that one, is like, if you're, I can't do all this stuff at my job. There's no way I can dissent. There's no way I can talk about mental health. It's time for me to leave. So the next event is actually like realizing you can't change the culture, but you might need to find a place that you can move to where the culture either already exists or you would feel more free to do that. Um, and then you can find links to these events at our empathyandtech.com page. You can also find it at General Assembly and I'll pull up that link here in a second unless Angela can pull that up really quickly. Um, and then the last one is managing up and managing down with empathy. And this one's really interesting because it allows you, so some of this might be that you don't feel comfortable like skipping levels as Casey introduced us to that, that concept today, or, you know, managing up is a really interesting thing. Like how do you manage your manager or how do you manage down or how do you manage across? So even if you're an IC, it doesn't mean that you're not managing people in the sense that you still have to work with people. So the very last one. Um, discuss how you can manage with empathy across all of your connections within a business. Um, so this whole thing is kind of, this whole series is based around this sort of reassessment that people are doing with their career and their workplace um, right now. So we, we really implore uh, if either one of those are, are good assets to your um, skill set, you should attend them. Thank you, Angela. Um, so, uh, so again, we'll do a follow-up email with all of this information. 
Uh, and if you have any questions, um, please, uh, you can email us at katie at empathyandtech.com is a great place to ask any questions. And then uh, also Casey can answer questions that are related to this event. Um, Casey, is there anything else to add? Nyota, am I missing anything? Uh, if you want to have post-event chat, there's a Discord for that, empathyandtech.com Discord. I'd love to see you there. Yes. Thank That's you, all. Casey. <laughs> and, and done. And done. Thank you, everybody. Concerned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hope you got a lot out of this. Yes. Thank you so Good much. Luck. <laughs> Bye. I love doing workshops like this. Yeah. This was a really good one. I like, I like it when I, you know, and by the way, anybody who's sticking around, we stick around and chat. If you want to stick around and chat with us, feel free. We it's usually take a couple of minutes too. to yeah, just yeah. kind of like hang out. And, no pressure. You know, fewer people, maybe if it makes it more comfortable for you to chat. Um, but we usually just kind of chat a little bit about how things went. And, and we'd love Hello. to hear what you have to say too. I have a really quick question, if you don't mind. Hello, yeah. thank you both. I was at last week's event and it was so helpful. I had to come back. And um, my, thank you. Y'all are great hosts. Thank you so much. My question is, um, how will I be able, should I just stalk you on Discord or the website? Because I'm really interested in getting into consulting. And when you spoke about having like the consulting workshop, I'm so here for it would yeah. be there front and center so where would it be announced on the discord or on the um i think i'm already in the discord but on or on the website yeah good so i will post about it in the discord probably in the open chat for now until if when we make a whole channel for it i'd love to do that if we get enough people and if you can plus one that then it helps me feel permission to make a new channel for that concept that's so one it'll also ad. definitely be emailed sorry say that again Oh no, I was asking, so I should just ask. I could, oh, this is just from class. So I should ask for support in the Discord. Yes. <laughs> you, can. Yeah. you may, I, I would love it. I would plus one your ask. And that's what, that's what I want to try to stir up. You would help. Yeah, that would really help because, you know, we're always developing content. So to know that a lot of people are looking for a specific type of content, it's easy for us to use our network to find somebody to, to come and talk about that. Um, or if we want to grow it and maybe it's like a support channel within discord for people yeah. who are starting their own consulting business. I mean, I can tell you it, it, the, the group that, that we work with, with empathy and tech, that's all it's already become a conversation around that. Like when Casey and I are working through his slides, I think we ended up discussing something about your business and when I was like, what do you think about doing this with your business? So like having that really organic conversation happening in a channel is also really helpful because somebody could pop in and be like, I've yeah. had that experience. Here's what worked for me. Um, so yeah, please ask for that support. And Stephanie, if you want to talk a little more about like what you would find to be interesting in that type of, um, event, shoot me an email at katie at empathyandtech.com. Cause I'd love to hear it. And then I can kind of help craft it as well and, and help bring that conversation into hey, the discord. Good. I'll put Feel my, free to reach out to me too. I think you have my email. And then Casey, I'll put you in there. If we do an event, the other part of your question, if we do an event or workshop, the best way to find out about that for most people is the mailing list at empathyandtech.com. If you have that mailing list, that's where we send all of our events. And mm -hmm. there's also the Discord channel, hashtag EIT events, which is mm -hmm. another redundant place that you can see our events when they're coming up. So if you're on both of those, you won't miss if when yeah. we do a workshop itself on it. Mm -hmm. But I think you can get a lot of value from talking to people, even if we don't do a workshop. Yeah, even just in the Discord, if you throw out a question like, hey, anybody have this experience? We've got some like really like people from all over in, in the Discord. And I found that their feedback has been super valuable. I'm mm -hmm. constantly pulling links out of the Discord and putting it in my to-do list. Like, okay, go learn about this later. That's something you should read. <laughs> like, <laughs> my I whole... have a whole section of things to do that I need to learn to go back to in my Google. It's it's bad. So I feel like I'm getting to the point of hoarding. That's why I said, let me <laughs> let me pull the gun on this one and just go ahead and add yep. because Casey, when you get to talking about the Python, I, I'm interested in Python, but I'm like, I want to add it to my my toolbox. So I'm definitely here for that. I'm yeah. putting that on that question, but I, I am going to reach out to both of you. Thank you so much for giving me that support. 
and having this class yeah. that made me ask. Thank you. Definitely. And thank you for attending. We're so glad you were here. Yeah. Can't wait to talk more. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to stop. Guys. Oh, what? I'm sorry. I was just saying, I'm going to stop the recording now. I realize we're still going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. You, you guys.